They should be the most innocent members of society, but children can be capable of the most horrific, premeditated and violent murders. I thought that they are so sadistic what they do to my son. Evil, just pure evil. What drives these children to kill strangers, their family, even their closest friends? I have completely blocked him out of my life. I have pretended like he has died along with Ellie. With access to police officers and their evidence. Charging a 16-year-old with, with, with murder is heartbreaking um, because, because they are children, they are kids. And the insight of a leading criminologist. When you render your victim less human, it's much easier for you to be able to attack and kill them. We ask if they're victims of their environment, or are they born evil? What sort of person can do that? We hear first-time testimony from the families of innocent victims. They're scumbags, through and through, and I hope they have a terrible time in jail, which they should, being child killers. As they reveal the devastating impact of losing a loved one. 20 minutes, that role took her um, to go off. And, um, yeah, and she died in my arms. On the 2nd of August, 2007, in Wall's End Tyneside, 18-year-old new mum, Samantha Majin, collapsed after being savagely attacked in an alleyway. She lost her fingers, trying to defend herself. Um, such a vicious attack that the, um, the knife, the hole of the knife went straight through Samantha, the whole blade. Samantha had been trying to break up a fight when she was stabbed 10 times. She just kept going and kept going and kept going and just didn't, didn't stop until Samantha died. Paramedics were unable to save her as she lay bleeding to death. It looked like she took, she took a breath and I, th I thought they brought her back to life. And, um, but obviously, I think it was like her last breath leaving her body. Shockingly, Samantha's murderer was a 15-year-old girl, Jordan Jobson. Violence is usually a young man's business. It's quite unusual for young women to commit crime of the severity. And then as we found out more, we discovered it was actually a, a stranger to Samantha as well. Jobson told police she'd drunk three pints of vodka and taken eight lines of cocaine before embarking on the murderous rampage. In court, she showed no remorse. She should never, ever be out in public to pose a threat to anybody else or cause any more danger to anybody. But then when I looked into her eyes, I could definitely see that there was... I could see the evil in her, in her eyes. 18-year-old Samantha Majin had the closest of friends and family. She was really loyal. You could tell her anything. She was always there for you if you needed her. Um, she'd make the sad times in your life happy because she'd make you laugh, and she'd always give off a like a positive energy, which you just you were drawn to when you wanted to be around. And as soon as she walked into a room, everybody's attention and eyes were just on her, and it was contagious. She could just change the mood of a room from a negative to a positive. It, she would always have a good feel to her, um, and everybody around her would be happy. Samantha's mum and dad were running a pub when she came along in 1989. Samantha was my middle child. I had Lee, who was three years older than Samantha, and I also had Carly, who was two years younger. When Samantha came along, obviously she was my first girl. Um, always beautiful from day one. 
Our dad was over the moon. There was me and our dad and the three children who had a lovely, happy little family. Obviously, I was the youngest child, and I, Samantha and Lee were obviously just always there. Um, I always remember I was the shyest one, always the quiet one. And Samantha, she always used to sort of be, if I wanted something, I would I would tell Samantha, and wherever we were, she would then tell the adult world with that, that what I wanted, I would, I would never sort of speak out myself. Samantha was a popular student at school. When I joined Year 7, she was in Year 9 and everybody knew who she was. All the teachers knew who she was. So when I joined, obviously, I was sort of the quieter one. Um, and I think Samantha was worried because I was so quiet. Samantha enjoyed school and she had some um, close bonds with a lot of, lot of teachers as well. And, I still keep in touch with some of the teachers now as well. Samantha was born and bred in Walls End, near Newcastle. Walls End is a large town just on the outskirts of Newcastle. It, it borders with the east end of Newcastle. The town's had its problems over recent years. It was home to Swan Hunters shipyards, and when the ship, shipbuilding stopped on the Tyne, a lot of people lost their jobs. And particularly the area around the, the High Street has been hit with crime and drugs. I think you had your, your normal, just sort of antisocial behavior. Um, but I wouldn't say it was anything major. Like, I was never, ever scared to walk around the streets. So, I mean, we hung around the streets and on fields and stuff when we were younger. That's just what we did in my teenage years. But I was never, never afraid to walk anywhere alone or anything like that. It was, it was a nice, nice place to grow up in. So Wall's End is a bit like something from a soap on the TV. It's like everybody knows everybody's business. It's very close-knit. Everybody's loyal to each other. Um, you're just a close-knit community. We all live within minutes of each other. I live up the road from my mum, and her mum lives up the road from, from her, and our aunties, everyone still lives close together. I think over the years it has changed. Like when we were younger, everybody knew whose kids were who and we all knew whose parents were whose. Um, but I think I think a little bit the community spirit has sort of probably drifted away a little bit um, compared to when we were younger. Um, but it is, it is still a nice place to live. 15-year-old Jordan Jobson had grown up in a town not far from Wall's End called Walker. She wasn't someone that um, was known to the police. She wasn't someone that was on the radar of anyone, really. She's from Walker in the east end of Newcastle, which is, you know, there are some rough parts of, of that area, but there's also a very strong community spirit in, in the area as, as well. She appeared to be, a, on the face of it, a, a typical young teenage girl. But Jobson fell in with the wrong crowd in her early teens and started experimenting with drink and drugs. She soon became addicted to cocaine and was expelled from school for repeated absenteeism. Cocaine affects the central nervous system. It puts a lot of dopamine into the central nervous system, which in short doses increases a sense of well-being. But if you're using as much cocaine as Jobson said that she was using, and she's 15 years old, that's going to make her feel very paranoid very quickly. She's going to feel that somebody is out to get her. To fuel her habit, Jobson got herself a much older boyfriend who himself was addicted to drugs. She told police that she had started drinking heavily and using cocaine since being in a relationship. She didn't want him or his friends who were older than her to think of her as immature. The, that boyfriend uh, clearly provides the money that Jobson is going to be able to use to buy the alcohol, to buy the cocaine. And therefore, the older boyfriend is somebody that we shouldn't ignore in relation to creating the context in which Jordan kills. That isn't meaning to excuse 
Jordan Jobson's behavior, but nonetheless should remind us that there is a relationship that creates the circumstances in which she feels able to kill. While Jobson's life had spiraled out of control, Samantha's took an unexpected turn when she reached 18. I was at work one day and I just knew there was something bothering her and she had a bit of an attitude. I was like, you know, what's wrong? Oh, nothing's wrong. And then she would storm out. And I just knew that she's possibly pregnant. I don't know, that's just a mother's instinct as well. But Samantha soon began to embrace her future. She wasn't phased at all. She literally just took it all in her stride. Um, she was just so happy to be like, waiting for this baby to come, ex getting the run up where she was like, just excited. Like every first time mother is, um, she wasn't phased by the symptoms or the weight gain or anything else that day to day mothers genuinely moan about. She sort of just took it in her stride and just got on with it. I think when, when she was pregnant, um, again, I think that was another bonding time for her. Um, she, she was so excited and she, she would share everything with her, like all her scan pictures and all our appointments she was going to. Um, and I remember she, she would let us feel the baby kick. Um, and she was, you could just see the excitement in her face and she was always smiling about it. Just under 10 weeks after baby Callum was born, Samantha had her first night out for months. It was to be her last. If she had to walk the other way home or chose not to walk home that way, probably the whole thing could have been avoided. 18-year-old Samantha Magin gave birth to her son Callum in May 2007. Her pregnancy triggered eerie premonitions in her mum. It was such a weird feeling. Um, I used to say to my friends at work, yeah, I'm sure she's going to die giving birth because I had this horrible gut feeling all the time. I used to think that something, oh, I had this horrible feeling something bad was going to happen. Obviously, it didn't happen at the birth, it happened later on. Callum was less than 10 weeks old when Samantha found herself in the wrong place at the wrong time. If she had to walk the other way home or chose not to walk home that way, probably the whole thing could have been avoided. She didn't have any connections with her no disputes with her, no argument with her, um, or anybody in who was involved. After two months of being a new mum, Samantha thought she deserved some time off. So the family rallied round to help take care of her new baby. When Samantha went out, it was the first time that I was babysitting sort of on my own at, at her home. Um, she, was, she was pretty nervous about us babysitting. On the 2nd of August, 2007, Samantha and her friends headed to the seaside for the day. She was looking forward to it, just letting her hair down for the day, um, just going out and they drove down to the coast. Um, like I say, it was a lovely hot day and she was blasting the music as usual. Well, then, just a short drive from the northeast coast where you have popular, picturesque villages like Tymouth, Colourcoats, Whitley Bay. So it, it would be it would be quite usual for people living in the town to, to go out to the coast, especially when the weather was nice. After a day by the sea, Samantha and her friends drove back to Wall's End in the early evening. And I always remember she came back to check on Callum and to check on me. Um, and I hadn't done his bottle on time. So it was when she walked in, he was actually crying. And, um, but I was waiting for the bottle to cool down and um, she actually told us off. <laughs> um, but then we settled um, and she was gonna stay in. And um, I said, oh no, don't worry. I says, just go back out if you want. And obviously she did. So making the most of the long summer days, Samantha and two friends drove back to the seaside. They went back out in the cars went down the coast again and blast that even had a ball and they were having a bit kick about on the beach and stuff. Had a bit more drive around. And then they decided to go and see a friend, James, who lived in Wall's End. James was a friend of Sam's brother. So I was in the house, sitting in my bedroom, there was a knock on the door. 
which has been about half nine, ten o'clock, I think. Um, went down, opened the door, and it was Sam and a couple of friends. So when I opened the door, um, obviously everyone was happy, but having a laugh. They were like, are you coming out? Are you having a drink? Um, they, had a, they had some drink there, and I was like, nah, I'm not coming out. We ain't my girl, went to get back from work. James lived in the lanes in the old part of Wall's End. So I went back upstairs. My bedroom was at the back of the house. Then I heard voices in the back lane. And obviously it was my friends and Sam and then went on the back lane. Samantha and her friends left James and headed for home. They were just chatting and four people went past. And one of Samantha's friends made a remark, oh, look at the way he walks. And obviously they must have been offended by this, but these four people went into a flat nearby. Samantha and her friends carried on up the street, but then two men emerged from the flat. One of them was the older boyfriend of 15-year-old Jordan Jobson. I heard, like, shouting and commotion. Um, it sounded like it was near one of the two shops that were just a street or two away. I was just remember thinking to myself, like, what's that, you know? A fight had broken out between Samantha's friends and the two strangers. She tried to break it up, but then 15-year-old Jordan Jobson also appeared from the flat. She was carrying a serrated bread knife and, without warning, launched a ferocious attack on Samantha. It wasn't just an attack where she stabbed Samantha once, so she just kept going and kept going and kept going and just didn't, didn't stop until Samantha died. This is classic for me of what's known as overkill. The perpetrator uses more blows than are necessary to kill the victim. And often when I'm dealing with overkill, crime scenes that have overkill as a pattern to them, I am dealing with people who have got underlying mental health problems or people who are not behaving rationally because they have been abusing drugs. Samantha collapsed to the floor, bleeding heavily. Jobson, her boyfriend, and the other man disappeared. One of Samantha's friends ran to her house a few streets away. Another ran back to James for help. So, um, I was like, ran straight to the front window, looked down, seen it was my friend. Um, ran down, opened the door, and he had blood on him, and he was like, quick, quick, it's, it's Sam, she's been stabbed. So, um, I've literally just ran straight out the door in my boxers to the end of the street, um, turned left into the alley, and um, she, she was just, just lying there on, on the floor. I, I, I didn't realise how, how bad it was at the time. She was just lying there, motionless. And then the ambulance, it, it turned up. Um, and obviously they were, they were working on her. And uh, as they were working on her, it, they, she, it looked like she took, she took a breath. And I, th I thought they'd brought her back to life. And um, but obviously, um, I think it was like our last breath leaving our body. Among 43 separate injuries, Samantha suffered 10 stab wounds, one to the face, four to the left arm, two to the right arm, and three to the chest. The fatal wound severed a major artery near her heart. At the Magin's house, Samantha's mum had just got home from work and found Sam's brother, Lee, in a frantic state. And I was actually coming home in the taxi and Lee was at the door putting his shoes on. He was putting his work boots on. And I said, and he was saying, "Mom, keep that taxi, keep that taxi. I was like, whoa, what's going on? Why, what's happened? He said, Samantha's been stabbed. And I said, well, she couldn't have, that, that just wouldn't happen. And he says, well, uh, he has, uh, a friend's just came and he had came up, run up to the house and he was covered in blood because he'd, um, apparently he'd been with Samantha. So we got in the taxi. Um, and I always remember thinking that 
that they've definitely made a mistake because Samantha wouldn't even be in that situation where she could get stabbed or anything. You know, there must be something else have, have happened. It's been exaggerated. Alison called the rest of the family to meet her at the hospital, believing Samantha was still alive. But as soon as we got to the hospital, obviously I knew. There was police everywhere and I could just tell by the face that it was serious. And I still didn't expect them to say that she'd gone. And well, obviously I found out that she did. But then when we got to the hospital, that's when I see me mum. And then I knew that. And no one actually told us that Samantha had died. My mum knew, but um but no one actually said Samantha's dead. No one actually said that it was so it just I just knew. It wasn't until the early hours of the next morning that Alison and the family were finally allowed to see Samantha. I remember I keep screaming that I wanted to see her because I still didn't believe that she had died. Um, I think it was probably about a good five. I was in the hospital before we even... We were only allowed to see her through a glass screen. But then I just remember trying... just banging on the glass, trying to get her to wake up, thinking she was going to wake up. I do remember that bit a lot, trying to get her to wake up. And then we were told that we um, sort of had to, had to see Samantha, but we weren't allowed to touch her. It was all through through the glass, um, obviously for forensic reasons. Um, and I always remember thinking, do I really want to want to see her? But we did, and we went, we went in, and and that that was my last memory of Samantha. I wish I hadn't have seen her, because I think in the early days it was always, it was always, it always haunted us. That, the picture of her. I just remember I didn't want to go to sleep. Um, Because I always thought if I closed my eyes that I wouldn't, I would stop thinking about her or I would stop seeing her. No one knew who'd killed Samantha or why, but the police investigation would soon reveal that shockingly, the murderer was 15-year-old Jordan Jobson. Which I found very, very hard to believe, especially because of the way Samantha had died, because it was so vicious and I just couldn't understand how a 15-year-old girl could do that. On the 2nd of August 2007, Samantha Majin was attacked in the street by 15-year-old Jordan Jobson as she was trying to break up a fight. She died a few hundred yards from her home in Wall's End that night. Her injuries clearly showed she was the victim of a savage attack. The pathologist said that her injuries were consistent with someone that had been trying to defend themselves. So it, it even if Jobson was to claim she'd been acting in self-defense, the way she had acted was, was totally disproportionate to any threat that Samantha would have posed to her. News of her murder spread quickly. Well, the night before, I had actually been on the phone to Sam to make arrangements to meet that day. And I remember walking out of work at nine o'clock, expecting to see Sam there. Um, and my mum my mom was there with her boss, and she just had this look of sheer horror on her face, and I'll never, ever forget. And I just remember saying, what, what's wrong, ma'am? What's happened? And she couldn't get her words out, and she then she started sobbing. And I was saying, just tell us what's wrong. Like, is it one of her, or is it like me nana, me granda, something happened? And she just said, oh, um, Sam's dead, she's been murdered. I just felt so, like a pain in your, in your heart. It, it, you just, your heart aches. Not just for your own grief, but for the grief of the people around you. And you sort of put your grief to the side because it, yes, it's your best friend, but you look at these people and they've lost their daughter, their sister, their mother, their niece, their grandchild, and you just think, if I feel like this, how on earth are you feeling? 
At first, the police had no idea who'd attack Samantha and her friends. Part of their early strategy to find the killer was to involve local journalists. The police were very keen to um, help us get to know Samantha's family because I think they wanted to make it clear that this had, this had been a random attack. You know, Samantha wasn't an aggressive person. She wasn't someone who was involved in any sort of crime or violence or gangs and things. I think knowing that Samantha had been a young mum, I think a lot of the time your immediate assumptions when a woman's killed is that it could be domestic related, it could be a former partner. And I think in your head, you always imagine that it's gonna be a, a man that, that's killed this person. Detectives soon had their first breakthrough when they received a tip off. They were told that the suspects had fled to a nearby house owned by the sister of Jobson's boyfriend. Her boyfriend had let them in. They had told him that it, they'd been in a fight. And could they um, get the blood off them? Just wash that, get cleaned up at his flat. And he just thought it was just a normal fight. Um, and the lad started work and they left anyway. I, don't, I can't remember how long they were in his flat, but they left and then the lad was getting up ready for work. He started work early hours in the morning and he's seen it on the news that a girl had been stabbed to death where he lived. So obviously he put two and two together and informed the police straight away. And obviously he gave them the names who had been in the flat. Four days after Samantha's murder, police tracked down and arrested Jobson's boyfriend. They didn't have to search for Jobson because the next day, her mother turned her in. Jobson actually handed herself into police. She went to a police station in Newcastle with her mother and made um, statements about what had happened. Jobson admitted killing Samantha but denied murder. She said that she couldn't remember what she'd done. She talked about how much she'd drank and how she'd been taking drugs. She talked a bit about the relationship she'd been in with the older man and how this had um, led to her, her drinking and drug taking. But she, she said she never intended to kill Samantha. She never intended to injure her. Five days after Samantha Magin's death, 15-year-old Jordan Jobson was charged with her murder. What was instantly different about this crime was when we discovered um, that a teenage girl had been arrested. And I think it was a real shock to discover not only that it was someone so young, 15 years old, but also that it was a young girl. And then as we found out more, we discovered it was actually a, a stranger to Samantha as well. When we first found out that was a 15-year-old girl who had took Samantha's life, I, my initial thinking was that she's the same age as me. Um, and, but it was it was pretty obvious that she obviously hadn't had the same upbringing as me and she was excluded from school. Um, and in my eyes, she, she mustn't have came from a loving family. She hadn't been taught right from wrong like we had. But yeah, she was, she was just so young and I, obviously the same age, same age as me and it was, it, it was frightening that at 15 year old she could do something like that. Most violence is still a young man's game, but what we have seen increasingly over the last decade, two decades, are numbers of young women who are committing violent crimes being convicted, and those violent crimes that they're convicted of being more violent than they have been in the past. Now, there's a whole range of reasons as to why that might be the case, but their involvement in street gangs, especially street gangs that are dealing and trading in drugs, is one of the contexts in which we see young women committing more violent crimes. And for me, that's what I see in this particular murder. Now, Samantha's family would see the face of her killer for the first time. They brought her to the magistrate court and we went in. Uh, they took us in the back way because there was a lot of press and that outside. So we went in the back way. And I was totally shocked to see that it was a young girl. I couldn't understand that. And she was actually standing there in the dock. 
I was shocked. She just looked like a normal 15-year-old girl. But then when I looked into her eyes, I could definitely see that there was... I could see the evil in her, in her eyes, because of the way her body language was as well. She just didn't comprehend of what she had done. In the courtroom, she just... I always say it, she sat as if she was just on a shoplifting charge. She was never um, remorseful for anything that she'd done. She took my sister's life, she took part of our lives, and she just never, it was never shown. It was just a full, a full attitude. Um, it was as if she was just talking about someone that she'd just slightly harmed. It wasn't as if she'd killed somebody. 18-year-old Samantha Majin died from multiple stab wounds on the 2nd of August, 2007. Five days after her death, a 15-year-old girl, Jordan Jobson, was marched into a local police station by her mother and handed in. I was thinking, how could she even just pick up a knife to cause harm, never mind kill someone? And she wasn't, it wasn't just an attack where she stabbed Samantha once. I mean, Samantha had nearly 43 injuries, so she just kept going and kept going and kept going and just didn't, didn't stop until Samantha died. On the 7th of August, Jordan Jobson was charged with murder. The day after, the forensics team recovered a bread knife from a drain in the street near where Samantha was stabbed. There was real shock when people found out who had killed Samantha and that it was not only a 15-year-old, but a 15-year-old girl. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't imagine anyone of that age could be capable of not just taking a life in that way, but in such a brutal and frenzied way. Samantha was trying to defend herself. She was trying to get home to her baby son and Jordan stabbed her repeatedly. Jobson's trial began at Newcastle Crown Court on the 19th of February, 2008. Samantha's family were there every day. Not one ounce of remorse, no compassion, no nothing. Um, she had two social workers with her every day. She had clean clothes on every day. Her hair was always perfect. And I just remember thinking, well, she's been well looked after. Who was looking after us? When I saw Jordan Jobson in court, it was actually quite a surreal moment for me. And it's something that will it's an image that will probably stick with me. I've covered many cases at Newcastle Crown Court, but I've never seen such a, a young girl sitting in the dock accused of murder. Jobson just looked like a schoolgirl. At the trial, the full details of what happened to Samantha were revealed for the first time. As she and her friends walked home along Albert Avenue from a night out, they noticed two men in a public phone box. As they passed them, something was said. The two men went back to a nearby flat, but then reappeared. Two of the males came out of the flat and had armed themselves with kitchen knives and started to chase two of Samantha's friends like round a parked car with the knives and trying to stab them. And Samantha was heard in the background for to tell them to stop it, stop it. While Samantha was trying to break up the fight, Jordan Jobson appeared from the same flat and launched her frenzied attack. A 15-year-old girl decided to arm herself with a kitchen knife and came out of that flat and ran over and attacked Samantha. Jobson claimed that she had no memory of the attack as she'd drunk three pints of vodka and taken eight lines of cocaine that night. But this was never proved. Jordan Jobson claimed to have drunk a large amount of lager, vodka and coke, and taken a large amount of cocaine. I think she was a 15-year-old girl. She was quite a slim, slight girl. I think it, it's difficult to understand how she was standing up after drinking that much, never mind carrying out such a frenzied and, and violent attack on someone. I do believe she was saying that, so she would maybe think that she would get a lesser sentence or maybe an excuse why she had done it. 
So it was five days later when she was caught, so there was no evidence of drugs or alcohol in it. Jobson also claimed that she was acting in self-defense and that it was Samantha who attacked her. Jobson did claim at one point that um, Samantha had been carrying a, a vodka bottle and that she had felt threatened herself and had been acting in self-defense. Samantha suffered horrific injuries. She was stabbed around 43 times. She lost her fingers. There was evidence from the pathologist that she'd been trying to defend herself and that's why the wounds were to her hands. The jury didn't believe a word of it, and on the 3rd of March 2008, they took just 90 minutes to find her guilty of murder. In a way, it was a relief that sort of justice had been done for Samantha, but for us, it, was, it wasn't a stage where we could sort of move on with life because it didn't bring Samantha back for us. Although someone was in prison for her murder, but it didn't change anything for us. It didn't change the way we felt. It didn't stop us grieving. Um, we were we were also on a life sentence, really. And we still are. We've still got to live every day with, without Samantha. So when this young commits a crime like this, people search for answers and search for reasons how they might have become like that and sometimes it's something like they've suffered some sort of personal tragedy in their childhood or they've witnessed domestic abuse or been a victim of abuse themselves. But we never heard anything like that about Jordan Jobson. In fact, there wasn't a lot of that that was really offered as defense in court. Jobson was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 15 years. She could be free by the time she's 30. Her two male friends were given sentences for a fray and her boyfriend's sister was found guilty of assisting the offenders. I always worried about her being found not guilty, but obviously she was, and I did feel a sense of relief that she was found guilty. And then I thought, I just remember thinking at the time, well, this is the time now where we need to try and just try and get on with our lives the best we can. I don't even know how to put into words. How, how, what do you say to somebody who's brutally and so violently, recklessly taking somebody else's life and showed no care or remorse for doing so? Like, there's nothing you can say to a person like that. There's, there's nothing human about them. Um, I think she should never, ever be out in public to pose a threat to anybody else or cause any more danger to anybody or hurt to anybody else's family. She doesn't deserve nothing. Jobson has appealed her sentence twice. It was eventually reduced by four years. She was due to be released in 2019, but while living at an open prison, she was caught threatening another inmate. She was sent back to closed prison. Jobson appears to have never shown remorse for her actions. I've had a number of anonymous phone calls from fellow inmates that have told us about times when she maybe breached the conditions of her day release, been sent from an open prison back to a closed prison. She's been described to me as cocky. People have spoken about how she talks about the crime and she's been quite dismissive and said, I just made a mistake. I think what this tells us is that um, more work needs to be done with her by psychologists within the prison to get her to truly understand what it is that she did and the kinds of behavior that led to her taking Samantha's life. The Majin family have to live with the knowledge that she will one day walk the streets again. I feel... Well, I know the rehabilitation hasn't worked because she's proven that herself. She's been in an open prison twice and sent back to a closed prison because of behaviour, threatening behaviour. I think the the way she's been in prison, a, um, a threatening behaviour and a, a misbehaving still, and still showing no signs of remorse at all, I think she would still show that evilness. And I think she wouldn't hesitate to probably attack one of us. But I know one day she will be released eventually. Um, that's something else that I have to deal with at the time. I try not to think about it. 
because the biggest thing that worries about me for that is how old Callum will be and him realising that the murderer is actually out on the street to murder his mum. I do worry about that. I think Samantha's murder has had a lasting impact on Wall's End because it's something that it's never gone away. It, it's it's almost like a, a scar on the town because, you know, a young mum from the town was killed in a, in a back alleyway in Wall's End and, and that's something that's never going to go away. It's something that people can't understand. They can't get their heads around. They can't comprehend that a 15-year-old has killed a local woman from the area. Samantha's son Callum is now a teenager and his grandma is making sure he knows what a beautiful and bubbly mum he once had. We're at that stage in life where all the happy memories have to be instilled in Callum so he can grow up remembering what a wonderful, happy mother that he had. And I never want to take that away from him. I don't want him to grow up knowing all the bad stuff about it. And the family are keeping her memory alive in other ways. Myself and Carly, my daughter, we decided to start a charity, Samantha's Legacy, to help victims, not just knife crime, but of violent crime, raising awareness, educating the young people, telling them Samantha's story. And that's what we'll continue to do now, is to educate young people, make them aware of, about carrying knives. We we'll tell them Samantha's story and I tell them how it is. I we'll tell them about the court, about the injuries she suffered, uh, all about that night. It is very brutal for some of them, but it, that is the reality of carrying knives. That's what it does. We are the result of someone carrying a knife and using a knife, either to cause harm or to kill somebody. And I feel like I feel now, because of we're doing this, Samantha's legacy, that Samantha's still here. She still has a purpose in life, and her purpose now is to try and make a change to young people. Alison does say that she's got a purpose now. I think after Samantha was killed, she probably didn't feel like she had much purpose, like, like anyone that, that's lost a child. But by being Samantha's voice and making sure that Samantha's name is known and heard to prevent other crimes, she's able to do something now. And I know that I can always feel that Samantha had a good life. She was loved. She had a good life. Even though it was a short life, she learned she got to be a mother. And she learned she just loved her son, got that chance within them 68 days. I do f feel I get a bit of benefit from that. And a benef the massive benefit is that she did have a decent life and she was loved with her parents, her brother and her sister. We'd done everything we could to make them have that happy life, which I feel the murderer never had. <laughs>